Three, two, one. All right, guys, welcome to the discussion of the metaphysical versus the man-made. We have been abandoned by our hosts, so it falls to me, Don Watkins, and to my wonderful, I don't know, what are we called, co-somethings, uh, James Valiant, to lead our own discussion. So this, th this should be interesting. Uh, James, why don't we just start off, first of all, with what you think this why you think this essay is important so it appears in philosophy who needs it it was initially published in the ayn rand letter um interestingly just after ayn rand wrote a series on the philosopher john rawls who also comes up in this essay so uh, and i think the way it's actually described in the ayn rand letter is an an analysis of what can be changed and what can't be changed or an analysis of what we can control or what we can't uh, control. So why don't we just dive in with um, what your view of what is important in this particular essay? I regard this as a revolution in the entire field of metaphysics, Ayn Rand's approach. Uh, as you know, her concept, the primacy of existence, is probably here best explicated in, in a concrete way than in any of her other essays. Uh, and I mean that. Traditionally, primacy of consciousness has dominated people's thinking and human history. A mystic, as she points out in this article, is someone who really does believe that nature, in effect, has free will, whereas uh, metaphysical reality is somehow pliable to human consciousness. And that approach, the, con the primacy of consciousness approach, has dominated Western thinking and even personal psychological thinking. And that gets people screwed up, badly, badly screwed up. And so understanding the distinction between what we can control and what we can't control is it lies at the root of so many problems. The application of ethics, the psychological understanding of its role, uh, the issues that she clarifies here just spread out in a million different directions. She brilliantly utilizes the Reinhold Niebuhr famous serenity prayer. Uh, she indicates she's not a, a, a theist and so she doesn't like the prayer form. But the insight here is brilliant. Uh, very often, uh, Buddhists or Stoics will get at least partially the first part. Grant me the serenity to accept the things I cannot change. This is sort of the Buddhist, you know, we can't, the past is written in stone. No one can predict the future. All we have is the now. So just let circumstances wash over us. Or the Stoic who believes that the most we can do is control what's going on in the, the corners of our brain. So we have to really disengage from the world. Um, Ayn Rand does not conclude that because she has the second part of the serenity prayer. Grant me the courage to change the things I can. And of course, the most important is the wisdom to know the difference. That is to say, the understanding of the metaphysical of the man, between the metaphysical and the man-made, the stuff that is within human control, which is subject to moral evaluation, and the stuff which isn't, which is the stuff we just sort of have to accept passively and let wash over us. That distinction, believe it or not, even though articulated in this serenity prayer, is still not understood, uh, still not understood properly. But obviously, the issue of human volition is the major issue, if you will, in under properly understanding the primacy of existence itself. Just as nature to be commanded must be obeyed, human volition can neither be commanded nor obeyed. Um, the insights here are absolutely brilliant and revolutionary, in my view, in terms of understanding and actually living philosophy. Yeah, the last part is, I think, one of the things that's so interesting to me about this essay, which is it's at once one of the most deep of her, philo of her essays, right? And that it's going into the deepest issues in metaphysics, and yet it's so practical, it's so oriented to the life or death stakes of getting this right or getting this wrong. And, you know, that pervades her writing, but it's particularly brought into relief here. Because if you think one of the most crucial issues, like set aside philosophy, sometimes we get kind of trapped in that world. But if you just think about going about your lives and kind of where people screw up, where they get anxious, where they get depressed, so much of it is around what do I actually have control over? 
right? Like how many times have people gotten in a car accident and you're like, oh man, if only I hadn't been driving at, you know, this particular time in this particular place or the, the, if you think about, um, the way other thinkers teach us to think about our lives, you mentioned the Stoics, you know, another popular thinker today is Jordan Peterson. It's like life is suffering. And the greatest evidence of that is that we die. And that's, it's this kind of view of life that, well, we need to judge life. If it was really good, there wouldn't be pain and suffering and death. It would be, I guess, what, just like all ice cream and, and, uh, tap dancing or something. And that, so there's this pervasive issue of what we have control over, what we can't have control over and what our attitude should be towards these things. And what Rand is doing is saying that like philosophy is what helps us figure out what we have control over, what we don't have control over, and then what our attitude should be to either side of it. And so that's really important. It's that you don't have control over the metaphysically given, and we'll flesh out more what she means by each of these, because that's a big part of the essay is what, what does it mean uh, for something to be metaphysically given? What does it mean for something to be man-made? Um, we don't have control over certain things, and we do have control over others. And then our attitude should be this acceptance, ser serene acceptance of what is. And then in terms of what we can control, being very active and ambitious in terms of improving, taking actions that improve things for human life. And I think that this whole perspective on the practicality of philosophy just shines through here. Absolutely. Just to pick up on a really great point you made there. Given I'm a historian, so given my historical perspective, think of think of human history in the past. The ancients would uh, sacrifice humans and then sacrifice animals to appease the gods. They would pray and get on their knees to affect earthquakes, the weather, the good harvest, whether they're healthy or not. Those things were metaphysical, and yet they believed they were within the purview of some consciousness out there. And so, what they were doing is trying to appease the metaphysical trying in effect to persuade the metaphysical to be differently or to be friendly on their side by appeasing the ruling consciousness out there. That is the frame of mind that governed most of human history. We have to appease, in effect, the metaphysical. On the other hand, when it came to society and creating a political structure, they had slavery and monarchies and dictators. So when it came to beings with free will, they would point guns and command and order and use force. As Ayn Rand points out, it is just as impractical to deal with nature by persuasion as it is to attempt to deal with human beings by force. That it is a category error of the most extreme kind in both directions, and only by understanding the actual relationship there. Ayn Rand does not believe that consciousness is some mystic identity, a mystical thing with no identity. Indeed, free will as a part of our consciousness has a very specific identity. It works in a specific way, and it reduces in effect to a specific kind of control, a limited thing that we have over our own consciousness. That's it. Whatever choice we have is a natural emanation of this natural fact that we can control our consciousness. That's it. It's not some, I can, abracadabra can make the, you know, uh, result that I, magical result I want come through. Free will itself is a causal thing with identity and has a nature and has a limited nature. Uh, we have the spectacle today of modern physicists saying that uh, sub subatomic particles, quarks, don't operate by causality. They operate any way they want, but a complex machine like a human mind that has evolved over millions of years could not possibly have some limited capacity for choice. Again, just like the ancients, they are failing to grasp the distinction between what is within human control and what it is, the metaphysically given, to which we simply must submit. And that confusion, as Don points out, still persists in a psychological, personal way. People will beat themselves up with unearned guilt about things they have absolutely no control over, but still feel guilty about, and they won't give themselves the proper kick in the rear, if you will, about those things which they can. Thinking responsibly, thinking things through, taking responsibility for your own life in the way you can. 
there is so much wisdom here about how to live a rational life. Uh, we could go on for hours. Yeah. So one thing I want to, uh, remind people of, or rather, um, hold on one second. Yeah. So given that we do not have a host, I'm totally eager for more to take, I think we'll have more time to take questions than usual. So as Rosie said, uh, you can put them in the chat box because, uh, we will not be taking live questions, but, um, yeah eager for people's questions reactions to the essay so now let's kind of step back and, and make sure that we're really clear so if we're saying that there's this crucial distinction between metaphysically given and man-made we definitely want to make sure that in this discussion we really clarify that distinction as an aside you mentioned history uh do you happen to know the first time that this distinction is made in objectivism formally in print. I'm not certain. I wouldn't want to guess about that without uh, certain knowledge. The in Galt's speech, she makes the substance of it quite clear. In her discussion, for example, of axioms and the development and the introduction of objectivist epistemology, she makes it implicitly clear in my view. But I'm not sure when she actually introduced the distinction between the primacy of existence and the primacy of consciousness. Obviously it exists, as I say, in the Gaul speech. She uh, directly addresses that in several ways and at different angles. Uh, in effect, uh, the whole of her philosophy, she says, is simply an expression of existence exists. Um, so uh, it's implicitly in Gaul speech, but I'm not sure, does Gaul call it the primacy of, I don't think so. Well, the primacy of con uh, consciousness versus existence isn't what I'm thinking of, but in terms of specifically the metaphysically given versus the man-made, that uh, interestingly, it's uh, Leonard Peikoff who does it in the analytic synthetic dichotomy is the first time that we get it spelled out and it gets explained in a theoretical way and it gets connected to the history of philosophy. And so we might come back to some of the philosophic points he makes about it. Um, yeah. But obviously, it's it's interesting that you know she's not writing about it until quite late um and so i'm there's two questions that are on my mind well you raise the primacy of existence primacy of consciousness maybe first i'll say a little bit about what i think is um distinctive about the distinct the relationship between primacy of existence and primacy of consciousness and metaphysically given in the man-made so the primacy of consciousness versus existence, of course, is the idea of, in effect, what has primacy, what comes first? Is it, you know, what is the ruling factor in the universe? Is it existence or is it consciousness? And objectivism's view is obviously that it's existence and it's consciousness that has to conform to existence, not existence that conforms to consciousness. And as, as Jim mentioned, this comes in different forms. One form is the idea that the ruling consciousness is God and that God controls existence. He could have made it differently than he did. Um, he can intervene in it with miracles and so on. There's the, um, the kind of individual subjectivist sort of view that each of us creates, you know, reality with our own consciousness and that reality has to conform to our own consciousness. And of course that, you know, we, if we think about catchphrases, uh, that's true for you, not for me. That kind of thing is pervasive. Um, and then there is the kind of socially subjective view that it's man's consciousness, mankind's consciousness, uh, or a particular tribe that is the ruling factor shaping existence. And the primacy of existence says, no, it's the, that it's uh, consciousness that has to conform to existence, that existence is what we have to be aware of. And if we're moving to the realm of epistemology, it's that good epistemology is what leads you to identify existence, identify reality as it really is. But then what's new or what's being added by the metaphysical versus the man-made is, all right, well, how does free will fit into that picture? So it's we seem to have an ability to choose to be creative in some sense. And how do those two things integrate? And the, you know, the, the thing that's really stressed in this essay is that it's what free will is, is um, uh, what's the way to put it? 
it is not your ability to control existence directly. It's the, you use the catchphrase Ayn Rand was a big fan of, it's nature to be commanded has to be obeyed. So it's your ability to rearrange the given um, using your mind, but only so long as you conform to the identity of existence. So I think what's, what we're getting here is from one perspective, an integration of volition and and part of the perspective I think that's being drawn out here is that the way that people actually in their daily lives fall into the primacy of consciousness is not some explicit like, yeah, my mind creates reality, but it's precisely by either treating things that they can change as things they can't or things they can't change as things they can. And both of those are forms of treating consciousness above existence. So if it's treating things I can't change as things I can, um, well, I, I lost the thought that I was going to make there. So I'll just leave it at that. Um, but Jim, why don't you go ahead and let's clarify. So what is she putting on the side of the metaphysical? And what is she putting the metaphysically given? And then what's she putting on the side of the man-made? Well, the metaphysically given is all the facts of reality. Ayn Rand had a, a unique approach to what, I, in fact, the fact that you mentioned that Peikoff was the first one to say this in the analytic synthetic dichotomy really should be no surprise to us, really, should it? <laughs> uh, the, the idea is that everything that is metaphysical has to be submitted to. Every fact of reality is an absolute. As John Galt says, a speck of dust is an absolute. In, law, in the terms of classical logic, Ayn Rand says, to be is to be necessary. There is no additional logical necessity apart from the fact of existence. Existence is all we mean by logically necessary, a revolution in epistemology. So our entire cognitive mechanism must be geared to the submission to reality. When we, as children, when we learn that we can be mistaken, that we can be in error. As toddlers, when we realize that closing our eyes doesn't make the world go away, those are the moments when we realize axiomatically that existence has primacy over existence, or, or, over consciousness, and consciousness is what must, must conform to it. So if it is a fact of reality, even a historical fact about human beings, human beings may have volition, but it's something they did in the past. That's metaphysically given. If it's a fact about the past, it's in the can, it's given. We submit everything that is not subject to human choice, volition, or control. And she defines that in a very specific way, is the metaphysically given. Now, are there potentials in reality that we're not aware of? By utilizing our free will, which basically comes down to our ability to think or not, to focus or not, this thinking opens up new options. It doesn't allow us to engage in magic. It doesn't allow us to wave a magic wand and say, suddenly, uh, you know, uh, uh, everything I touch that's iron turns to gold or something like an alchemist would want. No, only the metaphysically possible is even within our volitional capacity to control. But our volitional capacity to control is itself a limited phenomenon that begins simply with our ability to control the functions of our own cognition. So. All the things that are man-made are human institutions of any kind, human emotions of any kind. As you point out with his failure to distinguish it, how many times do people say, well, that's just me. There's nothing I can do about me. I'm just that way. Now, it's, they're not talking about some uh, liver condition <laughs> or being colorblind. They're talking about some personality trait that really may be some habit, some moral character trait that really is within their control that they're passively accepting, while, on the other hand, attempting to deal with human beings uh, by force. <laughs> um, that's really the power here is exactly that, defining exactly what's within human control and what is not. Now, at some level, even the man-made, as I say, has to be treated as metaphysical. Choices made in the past, even though they were at one point subject to volition, they are no longer. Also, at a certain level, institutionally, groups of people who are doing things, if they're making decisions, I as an individual sort of have to treat that as metaphysically given under certain circumstances. But even that can be changed. 
I can engage in persuasion, philosophy, work to undermine that. But say the political situation, that's man-made, even if it might take me generations to change it, even if in the near term, I have to treat it in effect as metaphysical, that's within human control. That's a man-made thing. Well, let me jump in right there, because I think this is actually one of the hardest parts to get of the essay, right? So in one sense, the man-made is that over which we have volitional control. But the, but it's, but that's not exactly right, because as you're pointing out, there's many things other, under which we have either very, very indirect control and influence um, or none. So like, you know, events in the past. And so she, this is where she stresses the idea of that they're man-made facts and they have to be treated as facts. And it's a question of which ones you can change and, and how you go about them. And so in one sense, yeah, you're treating them. And I know you hedged it, uh, but I'll, let me underline why it's a, it needs to be hedged. On the one hand, you in effect can treat them as metaphysically given, but in another perspective, you don't. So you regard, so it's, um, the way in which you don't is her point that it's the man-made can't be accepted uncritically. So one would acknowledge that, yes, there's things that I can't change that I did or that others did in the past. That's just a, a fact. But volition led to that fact. And so we can judge it in a way that we can't judge the metaphysically given. So it's not that I have influence over it, but that I can't accept it uncritically. And so why can't we accept it uncritically? Well, it's because the whole perspective on how objectivism judges things as good or bad is does it conform to reality or not? So we can't judge, you know, a tidal wave. We can judge our actions with respect to a tidal wave. Like it's pretty good to you know, build barriers and run away and, you know, or maybe hop on a surfboard whenever the, whatever the best course of action is. Um, but when we're judging the man-made, it's precisely we're judging it, does this conform to reality? Are we grasping reality correctly, true or false? And are we um, assessing it from a proper moral perspective, right or wrong? Are we, are we conforming it to it? Is this, are we acting with respect to ways that promote human life and so it's it's in that sense that there remains a distinction between man-made facts and metaphysically given facts even if we don't have ourselves control or at least not direct control over them how many different ways do they put this confusion into different cliches and you know shoddy thinking this is the way reality is people will always need religion or if we put ourselves in a time machine 200, 300 years ago, slavery will always be with us. That's just the given. No, religion and slavery are human created institutions. They can be evaluated. They can be changed and overcome by a future society. Do about how many times do we hear in one form or another that that's just human nature when it's not metaphysically human nature, it's a human institution, a human creation, the product of human choices and thought. Uh, that's really the ma massive confusion that so many people have. It causes internal personal misery and it causes people to feel powerless about what they can change and criticize. But if something is, has been ubiquitous in human history, for example, that doesn't necessarily make it part of human nature if it is subject to human choice and human volition and human thought. All right, so I, I want to dive into some of these questions, and uh, I think there's there's some other points I want to return to, but we've gotten a bunch. So uh, let's start out with, so this is from Black Crow. Rand says that the basic cause of the rejection of the primacy of existence is a failure or refusal to introspect. I understand why that is the case in regard to my own consciousness, but just cannot get my head around the cause of the belief in any form of supernatural consciousness and how someone asking who created the universe is rooted in the same air, the inability or unwillingness to fully grasp the difference between one's inner state and the outer world. So if you want to start riffing on that, I just want to look up the exact passage because I think it's, it's usually helpful in these cases to get exactly how she's formulating something. Right. Well, the, it really boils down to the nature of volition. Uh, you, 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 we treat volition um, 
uh, we shouldn't treat volition, even our own volition, right, as a metaphysically given thing. And that's, in effect, what we're doing. We know from introspection, to directly answer your question, that we possess choice. We know it takes an effort to think. And that experience of the internal effort that it takes to focus, sharpen our focus and think, is our experience of free will. We know down deep that we have at least a scope of choice. There's certain things that are within our choice, coming all the way back down to our choice to think or not. So introspectively, we know we have free will. We, just like every other faculty of consciousness though, I introspectively know I have a faculty like memory. I, just like any other basic feature of consciousness, I can't validate memory without engaging memory. So in effect, it's an axiom. It's a basic feature of consciousness. On the other hand, just like with memory and free will, I can observe and infer that Don has memory and free will. Don is, appears to be making choices, just like I know from the inside out that I have free will. And Don, remember that party we were at last weekend, Don? I know Don, by inference, has memory, but really my understanding of memory is axiomatic to my own consciousness. I'm merely inferring that he has free will and memory because I know introspectively that's true. And as I said earlier, the metaphysically given can be known introspectively. The moment I realized the world didn't go away when I closed my eyes, as a toddler, as a toddler, I knew introspectively the relationship between existence and consciousness. I couldn't define it in those terms. I didn't have those big broad terms as a toddler. I just knew the world didn't go away when I closed my eyes. So both the metaphysical absolute of existence and the fact that I have free will are known introspectively. They're an implicit part of all of our other knowledge, in fact. Any attempt to contradict them, live in contradiction, believe in contradiction to them, will screw you up, perforce. Yeah, so the, the place where she's um, talking about the introspection, so it's not um, that she doesn't put it quite as the rejection of the primacy of existence as a failure or refusal to introspect. So the context here is she's talking about she makes this claim that a major part of the philosopher's attack on man's mind is devoted to attempts to obliterate the difference between the metaphysically given and the man-made. And she hints at kind of the roots in uh, antiquity and talks about, you know, a professor who says there's no such thing as necessity in the universe and is justifying this by giving an example of the man-made, such as just as the country didn't have to have 50 states, it could have had another number, so it didn't have to have, the solar system didn't have to have nine planets. And then she says, the technique of undercutting man's mind consists in palming off the man-made as, as if it were the metaphysically given, then ascribing to nature the concepts that refer only to men's lack of knowledge, such as chance or contingency, then reversing the two elements of the package deal from the assertion man is unpredictable, therefore nature is unpredictable. The argument goes to nature possesses volition, man does not. Nature is free, man is ruled by unknowable forces, nature is not to be conquered, man is. And then a little bit later, she is going down. Uh, she's saying how people's reaction is like, this is just academic talk. And she says, if one were to tell them that the package deal made of this issue is part of the nagging uncertainty, the quiet hopelessness, the gray despair of their daily interstate, they would deny it. They would not recognize it introspectively, but the inability to introspect is one of the consequences of this package deal. Um, so, there, I mean, there's a lot going yeah, on there, yeah. but the one aspect that I will uh, that I'll bring out is uh, I mentioned before that Leonard Peikoff raises this in the analytic synthetic dichotomy. He raises this distinction, and it's precisely in the way in which philosophy since Greece has treated that um, the fact that something is so doesn't prove that it had to be so like the fact that you know ice uh floats on water instead of sinks that's a contingent fact that's not something that's inherent in ice being ice the way that being frozen water is inherent in ice being ice 
And from objectivism's perspective, this is a form of the primacy of consciousness. Because if you if you accept that existence exists, and that um, that things as a result, and that existence is identity, well, then things have to act according to their identity. And apart from human choice, to be therefore. Um, is to be necessary. So it's the the objectivist view wipes out this idea that we have to prove two things about the world, that something is and that it necessarily is. And if you know anything about the history of philosophy, so much of what's gone wrong, I mean, the whole Kantian approach to philosophy is ba basically rooted in this idea that we need to find not just that something is true, but that it's necessarily true. And objectivism's wiping the floor with that and yeah. and so um i mean this is so that's the more kind of philosophic side here is that that's a denial of the primacy of existence because there is no god who could have created ice that sank in water instead of floated right it's inherent in the identity of ice um as an aside it's not exactly an aside but this isn't what she's stressing here but the she talks about the technique of undercutting man's mind consists in palming off the man made as if it were the metaphysically given. Um, so much of what is challenging in philosophy and where philosophers go wrong is precisely they're sliding back and forth between the metaphysical and the epistemological. And at, at some point, that's something that uh, is worth exploring now because that, that really gives you the key to untangling difficult philosophers. Well, um, just as impractical to deal to attempt to deal with nature by persuasion or negotiation as it is to attempt uh, to deal with men by force. And when you see people attempting to deal with men by force, in effect, they are denying the, meta the distinction. When you see people attempting to negotiate reality, they are in effect denying this very distinction. And it is everywhere. It's pervasive. So, uh, Eric H asks, what's the difference between the animal-made versus the man-made? Could we expand the concept of man-made to an alien species with volitional consciousnesses? So, I mean, the basic point is that it would be any time that you have free will, any time you have choice, then it didn't have to be. And we can ask, does it you know, conform to reality or not? Um, I don't think there's any evidence that applies to animals, but there's certainly nothing dis there's nothing in objectivism that would say it only applies to man. Um, but as far as we know, it only applies to man. So, I mean, uh, man-made is a perfectly legitimate way to conceptualize it. It's just, I mean, there may be, uh, you know, very advanced animals that do have some, you know, consciousness itself is bringing control to the organism, but the control over consciousness itself is what humans seem to add to it. To the extent that some advanced animals might have some control, that's interesting and it's volitional perhaps, but they do not have a volition like we do. It's clear. We are not, we can walk on the moon. Think, think of the simple act of performing medical surgery, cutting into someone with a knife right into them with the thought you're gonna help them. Boy, that would be so counterintuitive if we did not have free will. If free will did not really control the operations of our brain, something like cutting into a person to cure them would never be available to us or taking all the amazing, almost suicidal risks of getting to the moon. The fact that we can act as our own destroyers is an inherent part of the power of free will. We need to have that kind of scope for control um, over our own consciousness, but over our own consciousness. Um, so one thing, so we've, we've mentioned this idea of the re reversing these two and the kind of the pervasive way in which people treat the man made as metaphysically given and, and vice versa. I just want to, um, name some of the examples that Ayn Rand gives of this phenomenon, because I think it's really useful in just seeing that it really is this pervasive aspect. So here's some of the examples she gives of treating the metaphysically given as if it's open to volition, that it's not absolute. And so we mentioned one, just as the country didn't have to have 50 states, so the solar system didn't have to have nine planets. She 
as a general one, she gives any form of trying to rewrite reality of in effect judging reality and wishing it were different than it were. So it's, you know, the desire for a universe where there's no frustration, pain, and illness, the rationalization that I would be brave, honest, ambitious in a world where others automatic, automatically shared those virtues, but not the world as it is, the dread of death, the f- uh, feeling guilty for not knowing things you had no way of knowing, feeling guilty for not having known yesterday what you learned today, feeling guilty for not being able to convert the whole world to your own ideas effortlessly and overnight. And then on the flip side, some of the examples we get of treating the man-made as if it's necessary and beyond evaluation or judgment is, I can't help it. That's the way I am. Um asking not what's required to do it, but can I do it? Do I have the innate ability? Um, Or when you make mistakes, not what do I need to learn, but what's wrong with me? We get tradition worship, worshiping and pandering to the feelings of others, regardless of the truth or falsehood of the issues involved on the premise that it doesn't matter whether it is true if people feel that it's true. So I find- be told that a political reality is a metaphysical reality? How often are we told that opinion polls have, have to condition the way politicians talk? Uh, don't know well, I, yeah, I mean, I wrote a book on the, on social security and the welfare state, and it was surprising how often the answer was not your arguments wrong. Your moral evaluation is wrong. Almost always the answer, um, I almost always might be a little extreme. Often the answer was, you're never going to change it. Everybody agrees with it. Like that's just a given. Um, so wh- why should we even think about whether it's true or false? So it's or right or wrong. It's a given the same way, you know, that nine planets. And they'll cut off any consistent or principled political discussion precisely because of some opinion poll that they regard as just a metaphysically given. Another one is human emotions, human emotions. It's true that, very frequently it's not easy to change emotions especially basic ones but a bunch of emotions are changeable but in either case they too are man-made they are the product of human cognitions and evaluations to treat emotions as sort of given that's it that's the way people feel people are always going to feel this way and then we have to accept that wrong we don't have to accept people's emotions or people's current political or philosophical opinions simply because most people feel that way or think that way. That would be, again, confusing the two. So Shruti asks, can you say a bit about how the distinction between the metaphysically given and the man-made relates to talent and skill? Well, I'll, I'll say just a, a couple of things. I don't know that they'll be um, particularly satisfying. So the I've read a little bit of sort of the research on... Uh, talent and skill. I mean, there's a book, Talent is Overrated. There were a couple of those, but then new social science research has come out and sort of, you know, overthrown or at least uh, put into question some of it. And certainly, um, I think it's very dubious just at a intuitive level that like, oh, what, what, you know, what made Mozart Mozart was that he started playing the piano earlier. Like that's, I don't find very plausible. Um, I think the the way I think about it is this is what's what we're getting here in the essay is that there's this crucial distinction between what you can control and what you can't, and you need to make it. And then you need to evaluate, you know, the meta, you need to evaluate uh, the, the man-made, you need to accept the metaphysically given, but there is a real question of in particular cases, it can be very hard to figure out, well, wait, which part is the metaphysically given which part is the man-made? And I think talent and skill, um, there's a real issue of uh, have I not have I have I reached the limits of what's actually possible to me? And or is this something where I need to keep trying and I could get better? And that's not obvious. I mean, if you take somebody um like you know, Michael Jordan, right? The infamous story, which isn't a hundred percent accurate in the way that it came down to us, but was, you know, got cut from his, I think middle school team or as early as uh, like ninth or 10th grade basketball team. And then it's, you could say, I don't have the skill. 
I should give up. And then it was, no, I'm going to, or I don't have the talent rather. Um, but then it's, you know, that drive, you keep pushing yourself and you find out, no, I'm capable of much more. But on the other hand, there are people who, you know, they, at a certain point, whether it's there or whether it's in a certain kind of, you know, career, like, Hey, I want to be a novelist. And I keep writing novels and then getting nowhere. And, um, I'm not happy with that situation. Like I really want to, you know, do something where I can make a living at it. You know, at a certain point you have to think, all right, maybe I just don't have the talent and skill set, And it's not an issue of, I need to keep volitionally trying to acquire this skill. I think the, there's a real, it's a hard thing in life to figure out um, what is within my capability and what is not. And what's, what philosophy gives you is at least, at least this much. Um, you should try to figure that out. And then if it really is an issue of um, there's some sort of talent that is just, I can't reach, you shouldn't judge yourself for it. So here's maybe a, a, a helpful sort of example. Leonard would often get questions on his podcast about like, you know, oh, I want to write a novel, but I'm never going to be as good as Ayn Rand or something. And he railed against that because the, like it, he said, you know, if he had had that in his mind when he was doing any of his work, oh, this is not going to be, you know, as good as Atlas Shrugged, he would have been paralyzed and could have never done anything. Part of what philosophy teaches you is that you judge yourself purely by the volitional and you judge yourself and, and by an independent standard. So it's not comparative. It's can I create work that I'm proud of? So the spheres in which you have to judge are more like, you know, should I, should I go into this field where I might not be good enough to ever get hired? So like, should I go into philosophy if I can't get, you know, graduate from one of the top schools and therefore get a job? Um, but, but what was I going to say about that? Well, feel free to dive in. I think I said the, the main point that I wanted to make about that. Speaking, realistically speaking, no matter how much I admire great basketball players and their skill, and no matter how much whatever their physical uh, you know, abilities and endowments are, they had to work hard and work really hard given the competition in something like the NBA. But given the fact that I'm barely six feet tall, it is not realistic for me to believe that I could compete uh, in the NBA with people who are considerably taller than I am. Um, it could be that I have some physical handicap. And so I will never be able to do certain physical things. Uh, I'll be re re relatively realistic. I doubt I could ever have been a professional ballet dancer, <laughs> just given my physicality. It's true that I could have been a better one if I devoted myself, you know, to it assiduously. And if I really enjoyed it, I bet I could have gotten a lot better. And, I don't know anything about ballet dancing, about being a ballet dancer. But the idea of being a ballet star, given certain physical limitations, may simply have been outside of my metaphysical ability to, to compete at that level. Uh, on the other hand, so understanding my own metaphysics is an important thing. I have to treat some of my, some things about myself as metaphysically given. If, for example, I have a physical handicap, if I'm blind. Those things have to be taken into account as metaphysical. And the, those are the kind of things we can't beat ourselves up over. Um, absolutely uh, the case. Um, there is, a, without a doubt, a limitation in every case to what our free will can accomplish. I cannot choose to leap to the moon in a single bound. Our, the metaphysically given, it also conditions what is potential for free will. Free will itself operates by a certain means. And that's a metaphysically given. All of those are metaphysically givens that I have to accept about myself and about even that part of the world myself that I can control. Uh, so a couple items from Stephanie. So the first one, current example of the air is unreliable energy we can get rid of fossil fuels and substitute solar and wind because we wish it boy there's a, uh, it is constant uh in politics isn't it trying to make water go uphill 
completely the left has been notorious for you ignoring human normal human motivations and incentives they're attempting to make water run on hill uphill every time they absolutely ignore human incentives they absolutely ignore human motivations they ignore the primacy of the individual as a thinker producer consumer yeah all of socialism in effect all of control economics is exactly that it's treating men by force and treating nature as if we could appease it and persuade it boy modern economics is a classic example of that very confusion yeah i don't this one doesn't leap out to me as a great example because it's um it's not clearly an issue of that well it will work because we wish it will work i think a a better sort of political example is the kind that comes up of you know nobody who works should have to uh should have to struggle to pay rent something like that it's it's some sort of should thrown in the face of a metaphysically given fact which is that values have to be created so the, the well, I was dealing with a guy the other day who said that the government has a duty, he's an Englishman, who said the government has a duty to, quote, take care of everyone. What, huh? That, in my mind, is really, it doesn't matter to him whether the resources are there, whether, you know, what is available. It, that's irrelevant. Wherever the government gets it from doesn't matter. The government has an independent responsibility to make sure no one's hungry. Whoa. Well, how do we even know that's possible? Where's that coming from? At whose expense? What's that going to cost? It's, none of that matters. We're going to make it so. Or take gender. Gender is 100% within human control. All we have to do is pass laws and change our moral structure, and any biological difference between male and females goes away. Talk about a confusion of the metaphysical and the man-made. And I even would go so far as to say that it, fossil fuels are an example. Until and unless they know that they can provide us this energy. <clears throat> they have no business saying that we have to replace it with some kind of pie in the sky theoretical thing that they believe will advance their religion environmentalism that's how i see it yeah but so part of what you have to get is how so this is a claim of the the grounds on which people are supporting something and the more starkly and openly and clear cut is that it's um tr either wishing away a fact of reality or ignoring and evading volition the more that it's a good example so stephanie goes on to give the example of the minimum wage i think that's closer to an example of the metaphysical versus the man-made in the sense that it is um the the example i gave before like nobody should have to work without a living wage right. and that that's i think a more open example of that we're we're judging critically the man made um so far as to say anytime you leave out the the causality here no one should go hungry everyone has a right to medical care all of those are sheer primacy of, of consciousness as far as i'm concerned because they have absolutely no connection to the actual reality that would make any of that possible or how they would even deliver it. So if I say no one should go hungry, well, <laughs> that's just an absurd assertion of subjectivism. It's whim worship. It's mysticism on the face of it. No one should go hungry. Well, that's given the fact that we have one enough food. So long as you're not at that side of the causation, you're not part of you're not on the primacy of existence premise at all. No one should go hungry. Everyone has a right to medical care. Gender is completely a, a man-made construct. All of these, in my view, are ultimately grounded in a form of subjectivism and primacy of consciousness. So, uh... and note the assumption on the other side. Reality can be negotiated with, persuaded with. All we have to do is persuade reality to provide enough food so that no one goes hungry. All we have to do, do is plead with the, 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 the reality and suddenly everyone could have medical care dropping out like, you know, rain, beer dropping like rain. 
it's it, it, it is both. It is both uh, treating humans at the point of a gun by force and treating reality as if it's negotiable. Anytime you hear someone say everyone has a right to medical care or no one should go hungry. Huh? So, I always will butcher this. Uh, Alejandro asks three questions. One is, have the better philosophers in history failed to understand the man-made versus the metaphysical issue? Parentheses, was Aristotle making this mistake when he talked about contingent versus essential characteristic? Um, I don't know. I, I I couldn't answer that. I mean, my suspicion is... I mean, what you can say is that they can't be making it fully uh, if they're not on the primacy of existence. And in Ayn Rand's view, basically no philosophers except for Aristotle were on the primacy of existence. And even he had elements um, that weren't fully consistent with that. And as I recall, and I was trying to find it uh, while I was going here through my phone, Leonard talks a little bit about... uh, Aristotle, I believe, and well, good old Aristotle, at least his head and shoulders above the rest. He identifies the things that can be morally judged as only those things within human choice. He says choice is what makes moral evaluation possible. Whoa, that's an important distinction. You read his metaphysics, there is a metaphysically given to be submitted to. That's that. We submit to the metaphysically given, and this is metaphysically given. For what we morally can judge or what people choose. So at least Aristotle had that basic distinction, a distinction that I think puts him head and shoulders above the rest. We can get into the weeds about what he thought about essence and whether it was metaphysical and to the extent it was metaphysical. Yeah, he does have platonic holdovers in many ways, but I'll give Aristotle this. In his ethics, he makes clear that only human choices are the things that we can morally evaluate. And on the other hand, the basics of metaphysics are absolute givens. Man will always go to Megara in, in the direction of Megara if that's where he wants to go. He will act on a primacy of existence basis with, with regard to the absolutism of facts. So when Aristotle is discussing metaphysics, he treats it as an absolute we must submit to. Why does a man go to Megara when he's headed to Megara? And on the other hand, he makes very clear that ethical evaluation is only the province of human choice. So in a very profound way, Aristotle was on the right track on this point. And I can't think of another philosopher who was as on the right track. Ayn Rand's revolution is that she understood free will like no one had ever understood free will. Her revolutionary understanding, for my friend Roderick Fitz has showed a uh, ancient Greek was a student of Aristotle who said something like Ayn Rand's theory of free will. It went nowhere. It caught, didn't catch on and was very obscure. But Ayn Rand's theory of free will is a revolution in this area. And it actually allows us to respect the distinction between the metaphysical and the man-made self-consciously for the first time in my view. Uh, his second question is, could you expand a bit on the rejection of the man-made versus metaphysical distinction in the environmental movement? Well, I mean, the fundamental thing is that it's a metaphysically given fact that man survives by transforming his environment, right? That we're a productive being who can't adapt ourselves to our environment, but has to adapt our environment to ourselves. And so the whole focus of like that that's the root of evil versus that's the nature of how we survive and that that's somehow unnatural. So there there's treating a metaphysically given fact that this is our means of survival as man-made as optional. And, and that's kind of at the root of their whole inversion is that they are rebelling. They're essentially engaging in rewriting and reality and saying, no, I want human beings to survive the same way slugs do. And the fact is we can't survive that way. We can only die that way. Um, there's probably a lot more to, to chew there. So I'm curious if uh, Jim, if you have any thoughts, but I think that's the fundamental um, way in which there, in which this distinction is at play in that movement. I, I agree. I wouldn't, I don't think there's much more to add. 
I think you could go to the other end and say something about the opposite. Ayn Rand makes a really great point in this essay. Isn't it a powerful observation that this is used by alcoholic, the serenity prayer is used by Alcoholics Anonymous? Isn't it? Accept the things you can't. Now, here you're an alcoholic, a so-called addict, a slave to your addiction. <laughs> right? Free will. What is free will? For addiction, that overcomes free will, right? Uh, 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 uh. If you accept the metaphysically given, surrender to what's already been. And then you, I'm not going to go into AA because I disagree with its philosophy, basically. But in this aspect, Ayn Rand is absolutely correct. Surrender to the metaphysically given. Surrender and accept even the mistakes you've made in the past. The only way you're going to correct yourself. But you got free will. Through thought and behavior, that part of you can come within control. You don't have to be an addict to alcohol. See, it's sort of the opposite end of it, isn't it? Well, and it's even, so another parallel on the environmental side uh, that occurs to me, and I think it's what the point related to the point you're making, Jim, about looking at the flip side of it. So we mentioned at the beginning, part of what Ayn Rand highlights in this essay, or at least it's implicit, I'm forgetting exactly, is the way in which like primitive people naturally like confuse and conflate these two right it's that the universe has volition and we stand in quiet awe and try to um placate the gods so so that we who are in effect uh unable to change anything um are uh, hopefully are let's you know uh given gifts and from mother earth and that's really what the environmental movement's attitude is if you think it's well, if we just stop trying to um, change what we can, then nature will take care of us. But if we go around acting like we can uh, uh, command nature after we obey it, if we actually act like human beings and transform our environment, then nature is going to come back and bite us. And so that's the whole idea of like, well, what, of course we should expect catastrophic climate change. We weren't sitting around just obeying nature. We were transforming it and impacting it in all sorts of ways. Or if you take the whole GMO sort of movement, it's the idea of you're, you are invading the depths of nature. And so nature's going to come back and get you. And so there's this whole view of it that it's nature that has volition and man does not, at least not in the sense that he can actually control and improve the world around him. I just had a thought. There's a famous quote from Robert Ingersoll, uh, the free thinker, American free thinker uh, in the 19th century, who said something closely related to this. Someone asked someone else come up with this idea. He said something very closely related. He said, suffering is a result, not a punishment. Happiness is a consequence, not a reward. If we think of God, you know, how do religious people to this day, God, please spare us this earthquake or this storm or this. So they're negotiating with reality because of this ruling consciousness that controls reality. Reality, we can appeal we can, by persuasion and <laughs> appeasement and the ruling consciousness is what we have to appease. Uh, our own consciousness is just a given who we are, we're sinners, we're corrupt, that's it. We just have to submit and pray. So even to this day, religious people will have built into their mentalities this confusion. Reality can be negotiated with. Human nature, that's just a given. I'm just born in sin. I just have to accept that I'm corrupt and awful and there are certain awful things about me that are just givens. That mentality still exists unto this day. Here's a really good question from David. People think there are some things, i.e. As, e.g. aspects of their personality or habits that they can't change. They've tried many times to change these aspects, but have failed each time. Isn't this enough of an explanation for their that's the way I am? Why does Rand think it's to do with listening to professors of philosophy? I don't get it. Well, if it is psychological, then we have to acknowledge that it's psychological. That's the primary thing, but we can't even evaluate it. Let's say that I'm trying to overcome a psychological issue that I think is causing me unhappiness, and I'm having a hard time doing that. 
my recognition of the fact that it's a psychological issue that I'm having a hard time doing with is the important thing here. That's the metaphysical part. The fact that I can change it to the extent I can is the man-made. And there is a gray line here. There may be things that are not, they're so embedded in my subconscious, say sexual orientation, but really there's no realistic change, although it may be a development of cognition and development or attachment patterns with my parents or something. Sexual orientation may just be so, even though it is a product of cognition and therefore man-made, it may be a given that we have to treat as a, in ourselves as a metaphysically given. But again, we might be able to evaluate it. Is that healthy? Would it have been better if, I, if the emotions were different? You know, we had this discussion on homosexuality. I, I'm not sure that it is a psychological illness, but let's assume that there is some emotion that you are convinced is a psychological illness. You may just have to say, I can't easily change that. I'm working the best I can on it, doing the best I can. That's the man-made sometimes, is just doing the best we can, even with our own psychologies. Now, in many cases, it is just a matter of cleaning our thinking up and our emotions and our behavior will change, uh, you know, given enough contra you know, behavior against that old bad idea, we do change, we can change. And if it is easily subject to change, then it is a moral issue. To the extent yeah. I'm aware that it is. Yeah, and so, I mean, my view is, I don't think her view is that like, people just sit around, they go to a philosophy class and the professor, you know, gives them a man-made metaphysically given package deal. And then they conclude, all right, that's why I, you know, uh, there's aspects of my personality that can't change. I, that, I don't think that's the claim. Rather, it's that when you are in a culture where the basic ideas that human beings don't have free will or that it's not a very useful, uh, that it can't, you know, shape their life in important ways. Well, then the kind of default is to think, all right, um, if I'm encountering any sort of evidence that something's difficult, then I can just throw up my hands and say it's impossible. So that's the way I am. If you read philosophy, who needs it? That's very similar to the kinds of catchphrases she talks about that come from philosophers, but it's not that we get them from philosophy textbooks. They're kind of in the air and they're grasped on to offer kind of final justification for our choices and decisions. And so what, typically happens is those kinds of things are in the air. A person finds something hard to change. And rather than struggle to ask, well, is it really changeable? Or how how can I do a better job next time, even though I failed in the past, they latch on to a catchphrase to throw up their hands and say, no, I don't need to do anything about this. I can't do anything about this. Whereas if, if you were really, if on the other hand, if the basic idea that went around a culture is that is the distinction between the metaphysically given and the man-made and that there are certain things you're doing by choice and therefore in principle can be changed. And again, the, the, like Jim said, there very well can be parts of our personality. Uh, I'm more skeptical of habits, um, but aspects of our personality that are not, uh, uh, that are not changeable, whether that they were um, innate in some way versus just they're so deeply entrenched that you know for all practical purposes you would die before you successfully change them um but if we're talking about things that are that are in fact open to change um then a person who was having difficulty they would look around and think um all right well so i mean take something like you know quitting smoking they'd look around and say well look people from all walks of life who've done it longer than me, more than me at all ages, like have succeeded. So this is something I can, I can't just say uh, that that's the way I am. So I have to figure out the how, what is it that they're doing that I'm not? It becomes a question of, of how, and this is the point that Ayn Rand makes about like, instead of just staring and saying like, do I have the talent? This is a different version. It's not, do I have the innate ability to quit this thing or change this thing, but how do I do it given that it's possible? And what 
she's saying is that if you have philosophers who are trying to obfuscate or at least not clarify this distinction between what is metaphysically given and what is man-made, then it becomes very easy to resort to that kind of catchphrase. So I take that to be really what her claim is. Yeah, and of course, any form of determinism will destroy this distinction. There's nothing you can do about anything. In effect, is what determinism says. And you won't even really know what you're doing because it's being controlled by other things as well. So, uh, there are certain ideas, I think, which necessitate this confusion, build in the confusion from the outset. Um, but this confusion is everywhere. It's, it's me. It's my nature. I can't help it. It's, it's who I am. It's what I am. And if, you, and if you bought into any form of modern psychological determinism, my Freud, my traumas, my damage, my wounds, there's nothing I can do. I'll always be this way. Um, no, there's improvement. There is better. We are, in, to some degree at least, no matter what the background, we are capable of better and some improvement. Uh, but it runs up against the wall of the metaphysically given, how much we really can do it. Uh, but to that extent, we should. But to the extent people are, you know, take alcoholism, Ayn Rand's example again, how it's used brilliantly, the serenity prayer for alcoholics. Um, this is just the way I am. I have, a, my grandfather was an alcoholic. I have the addictive gene. There's nothing I can do about it. Built in. That's it. That's the way I am. I'm helpless in the phrase. You know, I worked as a DA with drug court uh, uh, people. I'm trying to help get stay out of uh, custody for people who are just merely addicts. So I work, worked with drug counselors. And I would ask the question of, of drug addicts. So when the cop is present, can you avoid shooting up the heroin? Oh, yeah, Mr. Valiant, every time. No matter how much you need your fix. Yeah, no matter how much I need my fix. So then what's different when you get alone in your room? You still have that volition. You still have the control you did when you were in front of the cop in not doing it. Well, I wasn't really thinking. Ah, he's not thinking. His habits and emotions are kicking in and controlling and he's shooting up because he doesn't have the immediate. But wait, the free will was the same the entire time. And so people fail to recognize within themselves the distinction between the metaphysical and the man-made, constantly making excuses for themselves, oftentimes using some form of psychological determinism like addiction is a medical disease. So David asks, would an objectivist become sad when someone they know dies and why? Why not just accept the metaphysically metaphysical reality that the person is now dead? Well, Says Look, the, the fact realities can't be sad. I, I mean, yes, I accept them, <clears throat> but that can be a bad thing. <laughs> Lightning strikes, a, a tornado happens, a tsunami wipes out a village. I can be sad. That's a lot. It's no one's evil. I'm not blaming anyone. And that's the distinction. It's not like it's our, you know, 9-11 uh, happened because America was decadent, morally decadent, like some religious leaders thought. Oh, it was our fault. We were morally decadent. That's, you know, why uh, an earthquake or AIDS, AIDS, a disease, God's punishment for our uh, tolerance of gays. Wow. Talk about a confusion of the metaphysical and the man-made. The metaphysics of the existence of AIDS is our fault. <laughs> and what's really within our control is not ex acknowledged at all. <clears throat> it's pervasive so he, everywhere. So he follows up and says, they can be a bad thing, but why sad? What is the benefit? Well, I'm not quite sure if you, what the question is asking in terms of what does it mean to say what's the benefit. But and what's Stephanie says uh, as a follow up, um, if a loved one dies, it's a value that per that person is lost to me. Being sad is a part of celebrating the value uh, that person represents to me, and it's. Yeah, I mean, part of the fact that you're recognizing when you're sad is you're recognizing a fact, which is that I lost something that's deeply valuable to me, deeply meaningful to me. Um, and it's not, I mean, this is, so we talked about the way in which um, emotions are man-made, but they're not directly volitional, right? So it's not like you make a choice like, oh my gosh, my, my partner died how should I feel about this? It's that you, that your subconscious is giving you an automatic evaluation of this, and it's you've lost something tremendously important to you. And 
the and I mean there is an issue of um, why is that a benefit, but it's not why do I choose to feel sad? Is that a benefit? The there's kind of this trope that uh, is explored often in kind of TV and movies of you know the person who um, doesn't want to be hurt, so never ventures you know to love. Uh, or never ventures to try something where they're going to fail. And usually the what you see in the art is the way in which that is detrimental. You're robbing yourself of genuine values. And I, I think that's that trope is real. There's a really profound truth to it. I think people do do that. And it's a really dumb thing to do because, yes, you can protect yourself from sadness at the price of happiness. Like that's, uh, a, you know, Ayn Rand's analysis of motivation by love versus motivation by fears, that the goal is to live life, to achieve values. And it's necessary that in coming to value things and coming to have a stake in them, that when they're lost, it leads to suffering, it leads to sadness, it leads to loss. Uh, but the reason that, that, that it's a va- you can if you want to put it as sadness is a value it's because it's a side effect of having values right the emotional mechanism is an important part of our proper functioning to say that it's not that it's like the it's like questioning the pleasure pain mechanism if i didn't have a pleasure pain mechanism on a physical level i wouldn't know to get my hand out of the fire and i'd just damage and destroy my hand the same is true with emotional suffering about more abstract things the entire emotional mechanism is a value by saying that when something bad happens why is sadness uh we're not asking why specifically about sadness or whether or not it's worth being sad in that case if it's if that was a value your emotion like don says is an automatic result that automatic result is a, your body your subconscious telling you this is bad you have permanently lost something it, it, you now have to rearrange your future plans in a negative way. I need that signal. I need the emotional signal to say, this was really bad. I have to really think through my future now without that value, without that pain kicking me. Or th- on the other hand, what if I were to win a million dollars in a lottery? Someone just gave me the lottery ticket. I'm not a gambler. Someone just gave me the lottery ticket and I happen to win a million dollars. Shouldn't I be happy? I'm not happy in the same way I am about when my the book that took me 30 years of uh, a lot of labor to write came out, that's pride. But shouldn't I be happy if I win a million dollar lotto, lotto ticket? Well, of course, of course. It's my body, my emotions, my subconscious telling me, yes, this is good for you. You got to think things through now that you got a million dollars. Sadness, this is bad. You've got to think things through now that you've lost this crucial value. I need the entire emotional mechanism for my consciousness to work at full efficiency. So this is the last follow-up I'll take on this point, but David says, valuing something does not need to uh, lead to sadness. If you lose something that you value, you do not have to be sad. You can be happy that you experience it all. Sadness is a signal that you have bad ideas, a signal that you're not accepting reality as it is. And I just flatly denied that. Yes. I, I I say it's a hundred percent wrong that you know recently my father-in-law died and I a week later two weeks later I had to put a beloved cat to sleep and I was heartbroken to lose them and I do not regard that as not accepting reality I accepted it and it was shitty like that was the oh, the no, bottom the, line the sadness is the evasion of reality sadness is part of the reality. Your healthy, natural, emotional reaction that's telling you, yes, this is of consequence to you. And yes, you have to rethink your future without that value. Absolutely. It is saying that I'm not going to be sad about the loss that is evading reality. In fact, the complete reality that includes my psychology and epistemology. No, I couldn't disagree more. A A parent could lose a child. Can you imagine something more horrible? And they're not supposed to feel this incredible, overwhelming sadness. That would be the denial of reality and everything that the value of that child meant to them. Now, That's I do think, the- yeah, and, and now there is an issue of, um, I think, long term in most cases, there's, there, I think there's exceptions. Uh, losing a child, I think, is probably one. 
but in most cases, I think you can cultivate a perspective over time after going through a grieving process of holding it mostly as treasured memories of positives. Um, but yeah, yeah. that's very different from uh, the idea. I, I, mean, I think it'd be inhuman and monstrous. It's like, yeah. oh, my child died. Ah, I had some great memories. Oh, Don, you said something so wise in one of your own podcasts once that has stuck with me. Happiness is not about the current weather. It's about the climate. And that's the thing. Our resilience to tragedy, our resilience to suffering, our resilience to someone dying, will map our generalized happiness, our generalized self-esteem, our sense of purpose, are precisely the things that will give us the resilience to face that. When we have a loss, it can be a complex loss. We can have very a complex series of emotions. Emotions come in complex packages too. <clears throat> but the idea that you won't feel sad or that sadness is somehow a bad or unhealthy thing, wrong. Sadness is the healthy reaction to a loss of value. It helps inform you about your values. It helps motivate you about what to do in the future, even sadness. So Jonathan has in the latter part of the essay, Rand explains a technique used to deny necessity uh, or the which is the package dealing. Um, there's a typo in here. I apologize for my butchered reading. Uh, for or which is the package dealing of the man made in the metaphysical? I mentioned this, Don. Uh, she then says that by doing so, philosophers then manage to jump to the idea that we should conquer men, but not nature. How is this and why is this logical progression? Even James mentioned the ancients praying to nature and sacrificing men. And then he gives the quote from, from the assertion, man is unpredictable. Therefore nature is unpredictable. The argument goes, nature po possesses volition. Man does not. Nature is free. Man is ruled by unknowable forces. Nature is to be conquered. Nature is not to be conquered man is so i i think what he what he's asking is um that she's giving that it's not obvious how she's getting from that there's this inversion about the of the metaphysical and the man-made to an inversion and in, um in who should be in, in which should be conquered right that's the natural consequence of it isn't it if you, if you really think that human beings are just either determined by some eternal plan of God or some positivistic pseudoscientific way, the bouncing of their atoms, whether you're a pseudoscientific determinist or a religious determinist, it will have that impact um, necessarily. On the other hand, if you believe in the primacy of consciousness, all you have to do is appeal to the ruling consciousness, the majority of opinion, uh, God, or if you're a first person subjectivist like Frederick Nietzsche or something, but just appease yourself. So it's just a question of appeasing the ruling consciousness. For a theist, it's God. Uh, you know, for a, co a collectivist, it's, it's society. Uh, for the personal subjectivist, it's his own whims. So yeah, I mean, this is it's a really good question. Um, but if if we put it in the wider kind of uh, context of Rand's thought. So part of her view of, you know, dictatorship, and I think we see this if we look at actual dictatorships, right, is the denial of free will. It's that human beings are not capable of governing their own choices, their own lives, that they're fundamentally helpless. And in that, and in that case, then, yeah, they need to be subject to that which is not helpless, that they and so it's the divine authority or his spokesperson on earth it's the people and now you might think well wait you know aren't the leaders they human beings too so if you know they're to be conquered if man is to be conquered what about them but there's always this double standard in in these theories right like it's always that the people 
pushing them are exempt from their own theories. I mean, even take it at the most epistemological you know, context. Kant, well, we can't know anything about reality, but here's what's really true is that we have these structures and there's these two worlds and so on. Every, every uh, evil ideology and every person um, pushing an ideology for the purpose of power lust, they're, they're always a double standard here. But if it's that, um, in, that the, if you think that the, that a picture of man having free will and able to choose is at the foundation of freedom, if that gets denied, if we're fundamentally determined creatures, then that is going to be at, that is inconsistent with the view that therefore we should be free to govern our lives. We can't govern our lives. We can only be, um, if you think about the way that we treat animals, right? It's that we can't deal with them by persuasion and reason. Um, and so we have to herd them around and make our use of them. Well, if we're viewed as in effect the animals and nature is viewed as the the volitional God who can choose things, then it's the people who are the representatives of nature and the spokesmen of whatever the force is that has volition that needs to herd us around and and uh, be in charge of us. So I think it, that that's part of what's going on. Um, but I think that's a really good question to get exactly why she thinks that inversion um, leads to the conclusion that she does. Uh, let's see. So we only have a few more minutes. There was one question I thought. Oh, so Jonathan asked. What is courage? Is it simply a choice to act on one's own judgment when feeling fear, or is it an emotional state or both? I think courage, it can't, is the emotional resilience to fear, <laughs> in effect. <laughs> it's not, not experiencing fear, as so many people have discussed fear. I, I'm not quoting Ayn Rand here, but it's the ability to handle the fear that is a natural thing in a dangerous context. And so it is a, a, a moral character quality. It can be cultivated. Absolutely. I know from personal experience, courage can be cultivated. So I would say it is a moral quality, a moral virtue. Uh, but once it, like other values, once it is built into you, uh, into your consciousness, it is experienced directly as an emotion. Um, the ability, to, the resilience, the the command. Okay, this is a fearful situation. I can handle it though. So I'm going to work. I'm going to live with my fear. I can I can coexist with my fear and still be calm and rational and act. Um, so it, I would say courage is a virtue that we cultivate, primarily, although it can be experienced as an emotion over time. Yeah, and I think that that I mean that's um, you know the so objectivism thinks about virtues primarily as actions but part of what the reason that you want to isolate it as an action is so that you can cultivate it as a character trait and i think most character traits have an emotional component to it um part of it is that you'll want to do and you'll come to f find as natural or as aristotle put it second nature this mode of acting and so courage in that sense it's not isolated from emotional but it's primarily a a virtue in the sense that it's the um the the it, and, and james put it better than i will um but that it's yeah the resiliency to act in the face of fear and the uh and so from that perspective i think about it more in terms of the nature of the action than the emotion um Okay, let's see if there's one last question. All right, so um, with that, uh, this is we are at a close. I should just note it is shockingly hard to play both guest and host. I I don't blame anybody, uh, especially not you, Razi, for this situation. Who knew? Um, it, well, you it, notice I I hid under the table when he asked who could host it. You, you were you were <laughs> smart to do so. Great. I got cocky. <laughs> um, but uh, thanks everybody. Uh, just a few reminders. Next week we're going to be covering causality versus duty, which is great because I've been um 
reading nothing but Kant in the last couple of weeks. Oh, you and know, yeah, I, oh, I'm loving it. <laughs> I mean, not 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 as truth, but as usefulness. <laughs> And yeah. uh, I want to encourage everybody, if you're getting a lot of value from what the Ayn Rand Center UK is doing, and I, I certainly am and hope you are, and I know a lot of the people that I talk to are huge fans of it, the best thing you can do is become a member and help give them support. Even just you know $5 a month uh, goes a long way to helping us be able to do things like this and do um, more things. So you can go to Ayn Rand Center. That's the British spelling of center, by the way, R-E, not E-R at the end, dot C-O dot U-K slash membership. And um, hope that everybody does become a member and look forward to seeing you guys next week and uh it will be your duty and before we sign off i want to give uh jim a second to say something on saturdays of course we're resuming our saturday meetings but this is for members only uh one of the great perks of, of membership is we have a discussion an interactive discussion on saturdays we're starting this saturday with an analysis of leonard peikoff's course the art of thinking a really important course and you guys can participate everyone can really participate and interact on those Saturday sessions. So if you're at all interested in interacting in a deeper way about these kind of discussions, join us on Saturdays, but it's for members only. All right, everybody. Talk next time. You were a great host, Don. <laughs>